Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Partial funding is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Well, thanks so much for joining us here on another episode of Market Journal. I'm Bryce Duskett. Coming up on today's broadcast, we'll discuss what seedling disease is you should be on the lookout for when it comes to your newly planted corn crop. We'll also go over the latest when it comes to the grain markets with the president of Heartland Farm Partners. Plus, learn what to expect when it comes to the weather in the week ahead. That is a quick look at what's all to come on today's episode, but we begin with this in the field update. Between some spotty rain showers in eastern Nebraska, lots of planters were making their way through the fields this past week. Just outside of Crete earlier in the week, Darren Mink was paused in his planting progress. He joined me to share this update on how things were going in his, in his region of the state. I'd say in the area, I'm a little over half done. The area probably at least three fourths of the way done. Most of the corn's in. Um, beans are kind of hit or miss. Some guys are done. So, but making good progress. Weather's been good for planting. Starting to see some emergence on the corn? Spotty, yep. Some of us putting some pretty dry ground, having trouble getting it up. A lot of pivots running to bring, bring it up. And some of the early corn is poking through though. A little bit of rain. I mentioned we're hopeful today. We'll see what happens, yeah. but you did see some uh, earlier this week, right? Yeah, we got a quarter, quarter to 40 hundreds in this area. We had about a quarter here, so it was a nice little shower. Good for chemical, maybe not enough to get the crop out of the ground yet, but. In addition to the row crops, you've got some cattle. Yep. You see those behind us. Also, you've got some rye mix behind us. Tell me about that. It's a rye I've been using, started as a cover crop, then I started using it more for grazing. So I'll take a small section and graze late, or plant late by grazing it, but it kind of saves the pastures. It gets the cows out on something green, gets them healthy, and not putting them to pasture quite as early that way. How yeah. oh, are pastures? Is it starting to green up around here, or has that been tough as well? Pretty spotty. There's some areas that just didn't come out of winter very good, so those spots look pretty rough. Overall, it's pretty short pasture, but there's some green in the lower areas. Nice rain would sure help. <laughs> it's always been the theme this year yeah. as we do these updates is a nice rain would certainly help with everything. Yeah. I guess any other challenges you're, you're anticipating on the horizon, things you might face in this upcoming growing season? Moisture seems like the big one. I'm sure everyone's talking the same. Moisture's the big one. Inputs are high, crop prices aren't so bad, so that's not terrible. Mm -hmm. I said just moisture, hopefully. As we take a look back to the May 8th crop progress report, USDA estimated that 56% of the Nebraska corn crop was planted. That report also projected that 36% of the soybean crop was in the ground. Both of those figures are a bit ahead of the average pace, according to the department's data. Well, as summer break is near for students, some teenagers may be seeking employment on an ag operation. With that in mind, Nebraska Extension and Central States for Center, Center for Agricultural Safety and Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center have plans for their annual tractor safety training courses. Those are scheduled at eight sites across Nebraska coming up later this month and into the early parts of June. Federal law prohibits children under the age of 16 from using certain equipment on a farm unless their parents or legal guardians own that farm. However, certification received through these courses grants an exemption to the law, allowing 14 and 15-year-olds to drive a tractor and perform fieldwork with certain mechanized equipment. While this training is geared toward youth and tractor safety, there are a number of other topics that will be covered, and adults are welcome to register as well. Yeah, so uh, we talked about it being tractor safety training, but it really incorporates a lot of agricultural safety training and a lot on sort of the, the attitudes and beliefs of safety. Uh, so having you thinking in a safety mindset and getting you prepared to work, whatever job it may be, it's going to be applicable to that. Again, we also market it towards teens and youth, but uh, anybody at any age can take the course. It's not just limited to a certain age group. So uh, we see people transitioning into agriculture from other occupations that find benefit in the course um, and see that part of it. We cover a lot of other agricultural hazards like grain bin safety, uh, ATV safety is a big thing now, or utility vehicles. So trying to make a, a well-rounded person that uh, has a little bit of knowledge and safety of all areas of agriculture. While this course is geared toward learning about safety hazards on agricultural operations, 
It's also a great springboard to learn how to work on a farm or a ranch. The on-site driving training and exam will include a driving test and equipment operation, including ATV and UTV safety lessons as well. So we do have two of the events, the Grand Island and North Platte events. The previous day to the testing, we have a hands-on training day, and this is something that we started last year and it worked out great. Uh, so it gives the students an opportunity to do a little bit more hands-on learning. It makes them a little more comfortable on the testing days, and they are paired up. The first day will be the hands-on uh, trainings, and then the second day a little bit more training, and then the hands-on testing part of it. I think it helps prepare them for the workforce. So in addition to just keeping them safe and, safe and, and healthy out there, uh, it prepares them to work in agriculture. So we just touched the surface of what we should be doing safety-wise as we're operating the machinery, knowing that they'll still need to be trained at whatever job they start working at. Uh, but I, I believe it's a significant part of being prepared to work. The tractor safety training events will kick off with the hands-on safety days on May 22nd at the Lincoln County Extension Office in North Platte and then May 30th in Grand Island. This course must be completed in order to attend one of the subsequent tractor driving dates. If you cannot attend either the hands-on training safety courses in person, there will also be an opportunity to do so online. Following the hands-on training session, students will have the option to attend one of several tractor driving events across the state. Those will be available beginning May 23rd in North Platte and will conclude June 8th at the Cass County Fairgrounds in Weeping Water. The cost of the course is $35, and that includes educational materials, supplies, and the online learning link. Now, if you'd like some additional information on this story, you can find that by visiting the link. It's posted now on the Market Journal website. Well, as we established last week, May is Beef Month. To help Nebraskans celebrate, the Nebraska Beef Council is offering people the opportunity to sample different beef dishes from all across the beef state with the Nebraska Beef Passport. We recently had the opportunity to catch up with the Director of Marketing for the Nebraska Beef Council. That is Adam Wagner. He shared with us what we can expect from the latest version of that Beef Passport. The third year of this, correct, of the campaign, always a good chance to get folks out there eating great steaks, right? It, it is, and it's, it's hard to believe we're already in our third year, but lots of new things that we've been able to add to the passport over the years, make things a little bit easier for people to participate. And then, of course, we've also uh, got new locations that people can stop by as well. There are other new things. We will talk about those in a second, but for someone not familiar with this passport, what is it? High level, give us the overview. Yeah, so the Beef Passport is really just a, a kind of a roadmap to uh, great places in Nebraska where you can go get great beef. And so as it started off, we had restaurants across the state and essentially you, you get a passport, which is free. Uh, you put that on your cell phone or you can get a printed uh, passport if you'd like. You stop into one of the participating restaurants, uh, you order any beef item that you'd like and you uh, earn a code on your passport. Getting those codes uh, generates points and this year you can use those points to get a, a variety of different prizes offered through the Nebraska Beef Council. So how long does this campaign run? So we kick it off on May 1st for Beef Month, and that's a, a great time to celebrate, but then we'll continue it on throughout the summer. So as people are traveling through the state and they're going to various activities, ball games and different things, uh, going to family reunions, uh, they can uh, collect those codes on their passports, and then it'll wrap up at the end of September. We mentioned there are some new things here for 2023 in the third year. What are one or two of the new things you want to make sure we know? Yeah, so I think uh, the one big thing is that uh, we really encourage people to use the digital passport. So there are uh, added benefits for having that digital passport. There's coupons you can use at the restaurants. It's obviously a lot easier to collect those just right there on your cell phone. Uh, but as far as locations this year, we have some new restaurants, but then we've also done a partnership with the Nebraska uh, Association of Meat Processors. Mm -hmm. So we have about 17 locations that are small lockers across the state where you can go in and, and get those uh, items that we all love, those all beef hot dogs or beef jerky, or you can even buy some steaks to cook at home. So those are added locations we didn't have in the past, but I think people are really going to enjoy this year. So you download the app or print it out at home, go eat some delicious beef, get some stamps and win prizes. That's yeah, it, right? It doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like about this promotion, Adam? Well, I think the best part about it is that uh, it, it really highlights how great uh, the beef industry here is in our state. Not just that we have great beef producers and that we raise great beef, but we also serve it and, and enjoy it. So there's places all over, not just in the larger communities, but some of these small towns, small town cafes. And then it also gives people an opportunity to, to see those diamonds in the rough, those places maybe that are off 
the beaten path that you wouldn't normally go to, but you'd stop by and you find out that it's a great little community. So it's added, uh, you know, revenue into those small town communities. It's new people coming in and out of the doors of those little businesses. And it also gives a perspective for, for the rest of us to see how great Nebraska is border to border. A triple win, it sounds like. If somebody wants to get their hands on this year's passport, maybe learn all the details, what's the best way to do so? So the easiest way to do it is you go to goodlifegreatstakes.org. Uh, you can print a passport right off of the website if you prefer the printed one, or you click a simple button off the website and you can get it put right on your phone. It's, uh, it takes about 10 seconds to do that. You don't actually have to even download the app, it just uh, places that uh, quick link right on your homepage of your, of your, uh, your cell phone. And then from that point, you just reference that whenever you make the stop. So su uh, super easy, goodlifegreatstakes.org. Explore new places, eat beef, and win prizes. That's it, folks. That's good stuff there from Adam Wagner with the Nebraska Beef Council. Joining us as we celebrate May as Beef Month. Now, if you'd like some additional information on this year's Beef Passport, maybe you want to order one of those for yourself, you can do so online by visiting the website nebeef.org. Well, it is now time to turn our attention over to the grain markets. On Wednesday afternoon, we were joined in the studio by Heartland Farm Partners President Jeff Peterson. As we look at the charts, the latest activity, particularly when it comes to corn and soybeans, it's been a downward trend. It's a bit of a surprise to some people, as typically this time of year, Jeff, we see a bit of a sideways, maybe even a little bit of a bump when it comes to prices of corn and soybeans. What's going on? Yeah, exactly. That's a question that we're getting asked every day. And, if, and then let's just go back in time and kind of look at this a little bit, Bryce. If you look at it, it really started back on, on April 12th, but it started with crude oil. And since April 12th all the way down to May 4th, crude oil dropped $20 a barrel. And when you have that type of headwind and pressure on the market, since part of the value for what corn is worth and soybeans is worth is made up of energy, that put pressure on that market. But then we started to see the markets pull back on corn and, and soybeans starting about April 18th. And hard to believe since that time, we ended up seeing corn pull back about 78 cents. We ended up beans pull back about a dollar eight. But then we had a nice little rebound and corn came up about 31 and beans came up at 55. But then they ran into a lot of selling. And, and what happened in amongst all that, we have to think about this price is the the funds, the trend following funds, the big money, you know, they've been continuing to sell off some of their bean position. They've been continuing to sell off and get short on the corn side. So that put market pressure in. And then we thought we were in pretty good shape on export demand on corn, but then we've seen about 32 million bushels worth of cancellations out of China. Now, I, I don't think that's so much out of China that the fact that they, they physically don't need bushels. It's just they found a better deal, I think, coming out of South America later on. And then we've also had some pretty good planning weather. Or over that time for a while, we thought, well, there's gonna be problems up in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota. Well, that snow got melted off pretty fast. Now they're still behind on planning, but planning pace is picking up and now it looks like we got some showers out there coming into certain areas. Now, not everybody's got enough rain, but there's been enough there that the market actually kind of feels like it thinks this crop is made and I think it's a little bit too early to take that type of tone. Going back to the to the Chinese and, and what we're seeing there with them canceling uh, some of those cargo ships, I feel like it comes out. Sale announced uh, of X number of bushels to China. Then, it, you know, it's tampered expectations. Wait for the inspections is what a lot of the analysts will say. I'm sure you've said that to me, Jeff. And then it comes out they've canceled that. Does this happen every year and we just sometimes get short-term memory loss, memory loss about it? Oh, it, it does definitely happen. As a matter of fact, in commercial grain trade, I'll give you an example. You could have a train, you could have a barge, you could have a ship that could get bought and sold multiple times as they're moving along but from the time they leave their origin to the destination. So really all that's happening with China is it just so happens it's happening in a, in a very visible area. Now something I want to clear up, when they say cancel, I don't really like that word really much because it, it's really that they just offset their contract. And, and there's a financial consequence to that. If they physically bought it and the market had went up, and now I'm not talking about the futures market, I'm talking about the basis, then when they'd sell it back, they'd make money. But but honestly, if the basis goes down on them, then ultimately they could end up losing money and having to pay back some more. Hmm. Interesting. I appreciate that tidbit, Jeff. Let's talk about the Ukraine Grain Corridor. How successful was that when that was first implemented? And share where we're at with that today. 
Yeah, actually that has been so successful because here's, here's what's amazing about it. Before this, uh, the war got all started, you'd look at Ukraine, you'd say, you know what, they're the number four exporter of corn, they're the number five exporter on wheat, they're the number one exporter of basically the sunflower oil, and they would have shipped out about a billion bushels of corn. Think about that, one billion bushels prior to this um, conflict happening, this war happening. But actually what's been happening, because the corridor was opened up, they've been able to ship out over 800 million bushels of corn. We're probably about 850 million bushels. So it's extremely important, not only corn, but it's also important to your veg oils and also to your wheat market also. Well, share with us a status update, what we know of that deal right now. Yeah, so as we dig into that right now, what we know is on the 10th and 11th, it looks like they're gonna be meeting to talk about the higher levels and decide what it looks like is gonna happen. Um, Turkey has been saying they think that it could, could get extended for another couple months. As we'd expect to hear out of, out of Russia, they're saying that nothing happens unless all the sanctions are removed. In the end, I think that ultimately the corridor will get extended, but, but I think they may take it right up until the end or maybe even carry it out past the end of what the expiration would be. And that expiration, depending on who you talk to, sets out there on May 17th and May 18th. Okay, we'll keep an eye on that. Also keep an eye on weather this time of year, of course, Jeff. El Nino is moving in. Perhaps that weather pattern uh, is gonna set in later this summer is what some analysts say where we're at. What kind of implications will they have on the world stage though? Well, on the world stage, and actually, so let's start here in the U.S., it, it, that should give us some, some pretty good precip and actually some decent conditions, but there's actually some cold water that's holding off off of our west coast that's kind of keeping that from happening. But across the world, we'd have to look and say that can cause some problems with wheat production in Australia. That can cause some problems with not the, the monsoon in India not coming in soon enough that can impact their production. It also can impact the Indo Indonesia and Malaysia palm oil production, which is really important right now with everything that's going on um, because of uh, the, the renewable diesel and, and that whole push there. All right, Jeff, as we begin to wrap up, I want to ask you about old, old crop and new crop. If you've got corn and soybeans sitting around, or old crap, and you, perhaps you're thinking about marketing new, what suggestions are you making? You know what, sitting here right today, we need to give this market just a little more time. This isn't a place to panic in here, even though down the road we might have to ride this market going a little lower and then bounce back up. I would just hold it here though, but get your finger on the trigger for that next round of sales. All right, we appreciate the insights. Jeff, as always, thanks for joining us this week. You bet, always enjoy it. Thanks again to Jeff for joining us in the studio. Now we do have a special segment with Jeff getting his reaction to the May crop report, which was released on Friday morning. If you'd like to view that segment, head on over to the Market Journal YouTube page and look at what's ahead next week. We'll be visiting with Doug Simon from Trade Oz. Well, one of the most important things to do before rotating pastures or turning cattle out is to check in on the quality of water sources. Low quality water can reduce animals' health and productivity on the contrast, high quality water can increase water intake and improve overall production. You can learn more of, the, more of the details and the importance of water quality for cattle in the May issue of the Nebraska Farmer. Speaking of water, it's now time to check in on weather with Market Journal weather analyst Bill Boyer. Bill, this past week we did see some water in the form of rain all across uh, some portions of the state. How are things shaping up as we turn to the week ahead? Well, yeah, Bryce, the answer is for some of us, yes, and not everybody, but most of us are going to see some more moisture this week, thanks in part to the moisture that we saw last week across the region. Now, if you remember when we spoke last week, I showed you these areas and they've expanded a little bit in some of the coverage of where the severe dream and exceptional drought conditions are. And we talked about how this portion of the state was going to have a chance of picking up some beneficial moisture. This is rainfall totals just from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday to start the week. Look at some of these areas here, right down through the central part of the state, some of the areas two, three, uh, two plus three inches of rain. Down in the southern portions of the panhandle, two to three inches of rain and a good uh, inch or so covering a large portion of the rest of the state. So most everybody got some rain, beneficial rain this week. And I think we have a chance for some more especially as we take a look at what's coming our way. We start this morning with just a few showers. Now you're going to notice we're going to see more of a typical pattern of widely scattered thunderstorms here, and that's thanks in part to the wet ground now. It's going to help uh, produce some more humidity into the area, and you'll notice almost daily, nightly, chances of showers and thunderstorms, especially out in the panhandle. 
They're going to see those coming off the higher terrain and uh, see those almost daily. But I do think as we get late in the week, we're going to see another system start to push its way across the state and uh, maybe bring in another chance of some showers and storms to portions of the region. So some of the parched areas in the west probably going to do a little better this week uh, than the rest of the state. As far as high temperatures go, we're going to see cooler readings in the northwest, warmer in the southeast. But as we go into the early start of the week, those warmer temps start to rebound and warm their way across the region. We see temperatures rebounding into the 80s and 90s as we get towards the later part of the week in the eastern portions of the state. Cooler temps come in on Friday along with that storm system that's uh, traveling our way. So what are we talking about for precip? I told you I think western portions of the panhandle, far western Nebraska, going to probably do better than the rest of the state. But most everybody between the daily activity of scattered showers and storms going to see some moisture this week. It's going to be concentrated in some areas uh, with a little bit more. And as far as next week goes, our 8 to 14 day outlook above normal temperatures are favored across the state and in parts of western and southwestern Nebraska, again, above normal precip. It's good news uh, for folks needing that moisture. Some areas had too much, had reports of as much as seven and eight inches of rain from that system. I don't think we got that much coming this week, Bryce, but I think some more for everybody. Alrighty, thank you very much for that update, Bill. Well, when planting winds down, we'll soon be turning our focus over to seedling plants as they emerge. Seedling diseases are a cause for concern this time of the year. These diseases can be caused by several common, common soil-borne organisms and can often be difficult to diagnose. We recently caught up with Nebraska Extension plant pathologist Tamara Jackson Zims to learn more about what corn seedling diseases producers should be keeping an eye on. Well, it's good to see some corn emerging from the ground, but that's why I brought you in to talk about some of the potential <laughs> challenges when corn is emerging, particularly in wet conditions. There are some challenges that producers should be keeping an eye out for. What are those? Well, that's for sure. You know, there's always something that can go wrong. We don't want them to, but anytime we have any kind of stress on those plants, uh, even in the very beginning seedlings, we can see some potential seedling diseases in uh, both corn and soybean. And I, I just want to focus on corn today with you. And there's, there's a handful of diseases that can occur. There's some that are much more common, things caused by, you know, uh, Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Fusarium. And a lot of this depends on the conditions that we plant into or what happens immediately afterwards. And so uh, we know seed doesn't germinate until you're 50 degrees or higher. And so, really cool wet soils are especially uh, at risk for having some of these seedling diseases in corn. And so whatever you can do to avoid that um, or giving plants the opportunity to germinate and emerge as quickly as they can helps you outrun those types of things. Well, we do know some producers this past year did plant in that, those conditions you're talking about, cool and wet, just due to the timing of things. So what should they be looking out for? What are some signs that they might have some diseases popping up? You know, the first thing they might notice is they may notice they've got skips or plants that did not emerge. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong under, you know, under the soil line. And uh, often we'll have seed decay uh, or rotten seed or, or seedlings that can happen before or after they emerge. And so it may require you to, to get in there and dig around a little bit and see what you find. Because there's a lot of things, of course, that can that can keep a plant from emerging. It could be an insect issue or something else. But, you know, if those are impacted by a seedling disease, a fungus, for instance, they're going to be very brittle. They might be mushy and rotten and hard to find too, or they'll fall apart before you, before you can get them pulled out and get a good look at them. You know, you can always have those plants sent to the plant and pest diagnostic clinic to find out uh, which pathogen was at work or maybe multiple ones. But the reality is often the conditions that led to the problem, they may pass by the time you may consider if you needed to replant or not. And so uh, I guess the other thing to consider too is that practically all of our, of our hybrid dent corn seed is treated with a cocktail of often four or five fungicides that do a really good job. Sometimes um, a nematicide too, uh, usually even an insecticide. They don't completely eliminate the risk of a seedling disease though. They, they may help reduce that risk though, that threat. 
I'm glad you brought up some of the management after this. We'll, we, we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. But I was curious, is this something when you're out walking around in a field, is it going to be pretty isolated perhaps to some of those most wet spots in the field? Or is it going to be uh, something that you might see more widespread? Well, that's You're right. That's often the case. And so if you've got a place in the field that maybe doesn't drain very well, you get some ponding sometimes. It stays wetter a little longer. Maybe that's at higher risk. Um, that's that's certainly the case, but even even outside of that, sometimes just individual plants you'll see may may look a little uh, a little poor. They may be stunted or discolored. Uh, sometimes they'll recover from that. They may not die and melt down. And uh, those plants that recover, sometimes they may actually succumb to a different problem later on in the season. And so uh, that's something to keep in mind too, whether it's a stalk rot or maybe crown rot later on. So back to uh, the management of this, if someone walks out there, man, this is a really bad issue. Usually replant might not be the best uh, case scenario as you mentioned, but what are our options? Well, replanting, of course, it could be an option mm -hmm. for you, but you, you'd really want to consider that really closely and check out the recommendations from Nebraska Extension on how to decide economically if that's worth your while and how late you can plant. Uh, often the conditions have changed and that same problem may not be an issue again. I think I would keep track of which fields may have been impacted though, and especially if you have those low wet areas that may be repeatedly impacted, you may have something really specific out there and maybe there's something else you can do later. Maybe as simple as waiting until the end to plant that field and maybe it'll give it a chance to warm up, allow those seedlings to emerge faster and outrun the problem. Thinking even further down the road, maybe some tile drain and some field work uh, later in the year, too. It could be. When it's so dry, it's hard to think about that, <laughs> but sure. <laughs> Deborah, we'll give you the final word on this topic this week. What else would you like to share with our viewers? Well, I, I, you know, we don't see ceiling diseases every year, but this is something to watch for. Look for skips in your stand, and uh, there's lots of things, too, that we'll watch for later on in the season. That is Tamara jackson Zams joining us on this week's Crop Talk. We'll have more with Tanner coming up on a later episode this summer. In the meantime, if you'd like to learn more about crop diseases and some of the other issues facing Nebraska producers this time of the year, you can find the latest information in the, on the website. It's cropwatch.unl.edu. Well, that is all the time we have for this week's show. Do remember, if you missed a story, be sure to follow along with Market Journal on YouTube and on social media to join in on the conversation. You can also stream our entire episodes by downloading the free Acres TV app on your Roku or Fire TV devices. We hope to see you back here next time. Until then, I'm Bryce Duskit, wishing you a safe and productive week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Partial funding is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.